So, Jyoti Das, scientist of CSIR Simper, cordially welcome you all in the Platinum Jubilee lecture series. I also welcome my colleagues from uh, regional center who have joined through WAVE. Uh, as a part of the Platinum Jubilee celebration, CSIR Simper has organized a several lecture series by luminaries from industries and academia. Today, we are extremely honored and fortunate enough to have with us an erudite personality, Professor Udoy Moitro, Department of Organic Chemistry, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Sir, we are very much thankful that in spite of your busy schedule, you have given us your valuable time. We are also thankful to our venerable and effervescent director, Dr. Kodip Kumar Singh, sir, for his gracious present. <laughs> sir, at CSR Simper, we generally follow the custom of welcoming guests by with a booth. May I now request our director, sir, to welcome uh, Professor Moitra, sir, by presenting a book. I would like to request our director, sir, to deliver his welcome at this please. Welcome, Professor Uday, for taking time for us and uh, traveling from Bengaluru early morning to Durgapur, Durgapur to the here. And this shows love and affection to Simphar. And I don't want to say anything in biodata, Alka Jyoti will explain. He has very much good connection with uh, Dhar, Dhanbad, Durgapur and other places. So I was knowing by him, but when I will request, will be requesting him after just COVID, after a long time he is traveling uh, uh, such a place in Dhanbad. I was confident that definitely he will honor my request. And really I am very much delighted to welcome you, sir, and my scientists and uh, my colleagues who are connected with the wave in different part of our research centers, Nagpur, Ranchi, Bilaspur, Rurki, they will be very much benefited. We have our administration people also. I ask them to also be here so that some ethics in science, ethics in day-to-day -day activities will be getting a lot from you. So with these words, I welcome you once again in this auditorium of CSIR Simphal. Thank you very much. Sir, I would like to say that today's lecture on ethics and academic integrity is of paramount importance in our professional life because a research in the world cannot be fructified without these two. So being a researcher, we should be aware of ethical practices in our field. I am sure that after this lecture, our understanding towards ethics and the integrity will be enhanced manifold. Before that, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce Professor Moitra, sir. Professor Moitra did his BSc from Presidency College, Calcutta, and MSc from IIT Kanpur. He received his MPhil and PhD from Columbia University in 1986, where he worked with Professor Ronald Breslow, a renowned scientist in the field of chemistry. He did postdoctoral research at the University of California, Berkeley, with Professor Paul Bartlett. After that, he returned to India and joined IIT Kanpur. Later on, he moved to IIT, um, ISC Bangalore in 1989. His research interests are in the chemistry of bile acid, hydrogels, metallohydrogels, and organogels, organic, inorganic, hybrid materials, enzyme sensing, etc. His group has recently developed a general strategy for low cost paper based photoluminescent enzyme sensor. He is also greatly interested in chemistry education and is a regular participant in a variety of outreach programs for high school and undergraduate students. He has received a number of awards and honors, including the S.S. Bhatnakar Award in Chemical Science in 2001, and is an elected fellow of the Indian Academy of Science and the Indian National Science Academy. May I now request Professor Maitro to deliver his lecture. Sir, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Singh for the very kind introduction and also thank you uh, for the very generous introduction. Let me uh, share 
my slides first. I told Dr. Singh during our initial discussion that I will reveal something that, uh, okay. No, I have to first share this one, right? Um, right. This one, and I will share my entire screen. And I hope that this is visible. Let me go to full screen. I'm actually using a new gadget and that's why I wanted to use. Okay, excellent. Let me see if this works. Okay, this works. So there is something that I told uh, Dr. Singh that I will reveal uh, during my presentation and that is that coming to this institute is like coming home for me. Although home that I have not seen because I was not born at that time. The reason being that my father, after his MSc in applied chemistry, this was his first job in CFRI, in the erstwhile CFRI during this period. Um, mid uh, 1954 to the end of 1955 and he subsequently moved to Bilaspur and there's a picture taken in Bilaspur in fact and uh, so he was also a man of very high ethical standards and integrity so I thought that it is very appropriate that I dedicate this talk to the memory of my father um, and being in Dhanbad and of course I also know thank you I also know that Bilaspur is also connected, a place that I visited, and I visited the institute in Bilaspur in 2012, um, after my father moved to Durgapur from Bilaspur in 1962. So it's, it's really a pleasure for me to come back home uh, where my family started, really. Uh, it's, it's really a wonderful feeling, and uh, I'm sure that uh, you can all understand that. I should also start with a disclaimer because I've never taken any course in ethics. Most of the information that I'm going to present to you are in fact from, uh, taken from public sources, publicly accessible sources. So I'm not going to tell you anything that you may not find in the literature. But I have also tried my best to acknowledge all the sources that I've taken. Um, so that I cannot be accused of plagiarizing text. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so uh, this is the outline of my presentation today. Uh, I will start uh, by showing the main sources of my information. Some of it uh, will be av available to you. And I will skip a few slides in between, but I will make the entire presentation available as a PDF file, and I will share it with, uh, the director and any of you would like to take it and you can you can have the full version of it i'll start with them some definitions because this is something i i myself have to teach uh, i i had to teach myself um uh, information for students i will try to minimize that today because i don't see too many students here in the audience uh information for researchers that is more important perhaps in the in today's context and then towards the end i will talk more on plagiarism and publications um, what I would like to do is in the next slide, I will start with something in a lighter vein, because this is a statement that you, many of us have read earlier or, or have seen earlier. Professor saying that copying from one person is cheating, copying from many people is research. This, of course, is in a lighter note, but we will see uh, as we go along that this is really not true in today's context. Now, coming back to the sources, uh, one of the major sources is this book on ethics. Uh, this is published by the INSA and it is freely available as a PDF file. And this is this was one of my major sources. And the other one, uh, okay, before I go to the other one, this is the list of various uh, topics uh, in this textbook. 
For example, there is ethics in higher education and academic research, ethics of research, ethics in manage measurement practices, uh, ethics in science governance, and so on. So I will focus to a large extent on ethics in uh, research and in academics. Ethics in me is coming tomorrow. Oh, is that right? After tomorrow, he is delivering the 76th year foundation data. Excellent. So the author of the book will be here tomorrow. Yeah, author of this chapter. Yeah, uh, of course, he was al also involved in, in uh, evol evolving the entire, uh, entire topic. Excellent. Um, so the other one, in fact, this is probably the reason why I'm here today, uh, because I was in a committee in ISC which uh, generated this particular document, of course, we, st we all started from scratch and uh, sourced various information and came up with this ISC policy for academic integrity in research. This document is also freely available from this website, uh, our, our ISC website. So I have taken some material from that. Uh, but let me start with some definitions. I, I don't want to bore you with too many of these, but this is, as I said, this is something that I had to educate myself to know the difference between ethics and morality and things of that, side, that kind. Uh, so these are all from Google. If you simply type ethics in Google, this is what you, uh, you get. So my source is here, just a plain Google search. At its simplest, ethics is a system of moral principles. Uh, ethics is concerned with what is good for individuals and society and is also described as moral philosophy. The term is derived from the Greek word ethos. Academic integrity, on the other hand, is the moral code or ethical policy of academia. And this is the simplest definition that we will uh, continue with. But what I would like to do today is to show you a few more definitions from other sources. And again, at the bottom, I will have the source listed. Ethics and morality are interrelated, but not synonymous. In the words of this particular uh, gentleman, ethics deals with the formalization of ethical principles in the abstract or the resolution of concrete ethical principles facing individuals in their daily life. But you know, I have some problem with this definition because when you are, while you are defining ethics, okay, you use, make use of ethical principles and ethical problems in the definition itself. So it makes it a little bit of a, um, uh, little bit of a problem. Morality on the other hand, uh, generally refers to the tradition of belief that has evolved over years concerning right and wrong conduct so that morality has roots in belief of a society, while ethics aim at formulating the principles to justify human behavior. Again, I don't want to get into the details of this because I'm not an expert anyway. So I will skip this one. Uh, this, this is a very important statement, you know, because many times what happens is that our students and sometimes researchers are just not aware of what is right, what is wrong in terms of doing research and what exactly amounts to plagiarism. And this is something since I deal with, with, a, with a small research group, I've seen some many students, particularly when who, who take courses, they are just not aware of what amounts to plagiarism, at least in today's context. You know, perhaps things were okay 50, 30, 40 years ago, but not today. Uh, We'll again skip these uh, other definitions, but uh, the next couple of slides have been taken from Professor Ischandra Shikharan, my uh, colleague in the department. And basically, uh, you know, when people think of ethics or morals, they think of rules that distinguish between right and wrong, such as the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Or, first of all, do no harm. There's one more on this. Thou shalt not kill. And basically what we are looking at, most common way of defining ethics is that norms for conduct that distinguish between acceptable and unacceptable behavior. There is, there is some issue here because, you know, this what is acceptable, what is not acceptable is somewhat dependent on the society you are talking about. Because what is acceptable let's say in the Indian society may not be acceptable in the Western society and vice versa. So we need to be aware of this. On the other hand, I would also like to point out to you that ethical guidelines are not laws. Laws are different because what is unethical need not necessarily be illegal. Uh, on the other hand, 
wrong is wrong if even if everyone is doing it and right is right even if no one is doing it and uh, something that we see on the roads every single day is that you know despite this red light uh, traffic is passing through uh, because there is no cross traffic or simply because you don't want to wait there and that of course is there's nothing unethical about it because it is simply illegal the point here is that illegal is an act against the law whereas unethical is against morality so from that point of view illegal behavior is easy to detect uh, um, however unethical behavior is not easy to detect and as i mentioned earlier international laws are similar for all for example you know passing through red light is is not acceptable is against the law in all countries right on the other hand unethical behavior can vary from or what is acceptable what is not acceptable can can be somewhat society dependent we will not go into those details today uh, so in terms of academic integrity uh, for students and researchers i will focus less on the students aspects today um, basically what happens is that at least in the academic con uh, uh, context where there is a mismatch between institutional goals and competence of employees unethical practices creep in and again i will skip through uh, i i'm not going to read out most of those what i have written here in the in the text but the point is that a flourishing academic env environment entails rigorous and sincere adherence to ethical guidelines so it's very important that researchers and students are aware of commonly recognized unacceptable behavior so that they don't do such things in research and research communi uh, communication uh three broad categories of improper academic behavior this is more in the context of students uh is plagiarism cheating and conflict of interest um i will not go into the details because plagiarism will be coming back and forth a number of times uh so this slide basically talks about plagiarism uh as i said i will skip this part uh this is what was is meant for our students this is taken from this document for our uh, students and again this is uh, freely available on the, on the website so i will skip all the details but plagiarism of course includes uh, self plagiarism as well uh, the thing that i would like to mention is cheating um, cheating is another form of unacceptable academic behavior and it can be classified into different categories uh, that includes fabrication and falsification of data and reporting them in thesis and publication so i will spend a little more time on this thing with some uh, specific examples a uh, little bit later in the context of uh, research uh, communications and the third one is conflict of interest and uh, this is also something that those of us who are particularly who are in the in various committees um, we have to be very very careful about uh, ensuring that there is no conflict of interest and this basically is not necessarily always restricted to personal financial gain because sometimes in academic suppose i am i am member of an interview committee i cannot be a member if my student or somebody i am collaborating with is also being interviewed so that's sort of unethical and now it is strictly forbidden um for example um when when you are in a grant giving committee in one of these program advisory committees uh even if your student or your colleague or somebody from your institution has a has a proposal i have to just walk out of uh, of the room and recently i went through this and i was sitting outside for half an hour when uh, they were discussing about my colleague and so so that's very important in fact it's it's important that you know this has been recognized now uh because um, clearly there are conflicts of interest in in such cases and similarly i cannot be uh in a committee uh for example which is looking for promoting my uh, former student let's say in another institution so that is simply against the conflict of uh, uh interest policy uh i will spend more time on research misconduct and this is where 
many problems come in and I would like to highlight some of these. But before I get into this, let me just point out to you how research basically goes on. I'm sure that, you know, this is something I'm not telling you anything new. Uh, basically, a research flow chart goes like this, that you start with an idea which gets developed into a proposal. You apply for funding and, you know, this, of course, can go in cycles because sometimes proposals don't get funded. So you write it again. But that, that part is, is beyond today's discussion. If it gets funded, then you execute the project, get the project to work out and hopefully generate new knowledge that translates into papers, patents, products, PhDs, etc., depending upon what kind of institution you are working in. Uh, unethical practices in different forms are known to arise in each of the steps, okay? Because the idea has to be, has to come from the individual who is generating the proposal. If it is somebody else's idea, and I claim that it is my proposal, then clearly I have cheated, or there's a misconduct, or a very serious misconduct. There have also been cases where people have reviewed proposals, rejected proposals, but developed proposals using the idea which they did not fund. And there have been cases like this in the United States a number of years ago, and some of them involve very well-known people. And these are clearly completely unacceptable. So uh, unethical practices come, can come in any of these stages, in the funding, in the execution, and in developing papers, patents, products, et cetera, et cetera. So I will uh, focus a little bit on some of these aspects today. Uh, research misconduct, it constitutes a serious deviation from the accepted practice in proposing, performing, and or reviewing research and it's reporting research results, basically summing up all the steps that I showed in the previous slides. It includes, but not necessarily limited to fabrication of data, falsification of data, plagiarism, deliberate interference, misrepresentation, etc. And I will try to highlight some of these points in the subsequent slides. Misconduct may also occur in the research setting but it does not affect the integrity of the research record. Okay, so this is, these are things that I will not discuss today, which are indicated here, misallocation, misuse of funds, sexual harassment, and gender discrimination. These are very important issues um, involving ethical and unethical behavior, but these issues, as I said, it does not affect the integrity of the research record, so I will, I will skip that part today. In any case, you know, that will lead to a much longer a discussion. Fabrication is making up data or results and recording or reporting them as if they were real. This has become a very serious problem uh, in many cases and I'm sure that many of you have been have seen examples where people have fabricated data and got caught. Falsification is manipulation of research materials, equipment or processes and are changing or omitting data or results without scientific justification, so that the research is not accurately represented in scientific record. Uh, it also includes improperly reproducing copyrighted material rather than acquiring the material from an authorized source. Plagiarism, of course, is copying, simply copying. Uh, copying of another person's ideas, processes, results, words, or works without giving appropriate credit to the original source. Uh, it will include stealing another person's research ideas, research plan, research observations, or research data. And as we discussed before, I have highlighted this point that it also includes self-plagiarism. In fact, very famous people have been accused of self-plagiarizing, uh, self-plagiarism because they copied verbatim statements published earlier by the same person. I cannot do that anymore. Um, I, I will again expand on this thing a little bit uh, in little more detail towards the end. But basically the point is that if I'm using somebody else's statements or data, I must include them within quotes and appropriately acknowledge. As long as it is acknowledged correctly, people would know that it's not my statement. It's somebody else's statement that I'm producing verbatim 
but giving full acknowledgement. Of course, I cannot simply copy one full page, right? So there are certain restrictions about that, but self-plagiarism is something that we should also be aware of. Deliberate interference is another issue that is sometimes hard to detect, but then it can cause material harm to another individual. For example, suppose I'm working on a particular bench and there is another person working next to me and I destroy that other person's experiments for whatever reason. Okay, that is deliberate inter interference. And I will give you a very specific example of that um, towards the end. It, it can be uh, damage or inten intentional uh, or reckless unauthorized use of research related properties of another. Uh, it can include apparatus, materials, writings, hardware, software, or any other substances or derivatives used in or produced by the conduct of research. This can be a very serious issue uh, and that can lead to very serious uh, sanctions. Again, I will, not, uh, I will not go into the details of uh, many of these, but the other one that I have not described so far is misrepresentation. It's basically, it is uh, I have given the, you know, some of the examples here, how one can misrepresent, but the bottom line is that if I am providing misleading and false information, then that represents misrepresentation, okay? And it can be in various ways which are listed here, but it's, it's again, not a, not a complete list. And some of these details are available in, in the document uh, on academic integrity available from our website. Okay, <clears throat> having said all these issues about research misconduct, but I would also like to highlight to you what research misconduct does not include, and that is honest error, honest difference of opinion, or honest differences in the design, execution, interpretation, or judgment in using research methods or results, or simply bad research. If I'm very sloppy, and generate bad data, that's not necessarily unethical or research misconduct. It's just that I'm a bad researcher, okay? And people would know. Um, of course, if, if I do bad research, I shouldn't be doing research anyway. Okay, so that, that's a different issue. But uh, you notice that I have italicized honest in all these examples, because how do you know that it is an honest error or an honest difference in opinion? So whenever there's a issue like this that, you know, I did that because it can so happen that I have done research correctly, but my interpretation is incorrect. Okay. And that's my problem because the same results, I have missed something, I misinterpreted, but I didn't do it deliberately. So if, if that happens, then this, this amounts to an honest error. Because I'm, I'm simply, again, a sloppy researcher or a bad researcher, didn't think about what the results actually mean to me, but came up with an interpretation or um, an explanation that is actually not correct. So that can be an honest error or honest sort of judgment or honest interpretation, uh, error, interpretation error. Uh, but as I said in the lower paragraph here, to determine the same, it is imperative that there's a proper documentation in place to ascertain first if there's a departure from accepted practices. Because if, if such an issue comes up ever for discussion that uh, somebody has committed misconduct, then one wants to figure out, uh, set up a committee and then figure out whether it is actually misconduct or is it because of honest error. Uh, I will very briefly show you a few points uh, from our uh, institute, uh, institute's uh, opinion about what the student should do. Uh, so before submitting, for example, the, uh, a thesis to the, to the department, the student has to check the thesis for plagiarism. Okay? And that the student has to do using um, either commercial software or at least in the first round using a web-based plagiarism check. And the student should also certify that uh, the academic guidelines of the institute has 
have have been followed okay of course the guidelines are different from institute to institute but i think in the in the indian context things are kind of getting uh, very similar and uniform uh, principles are being followed in most academic institutions granting phd degrees um, but i must say that web check does not necessarily rule out plagiarism uh, but the, what a faculty should do once my student submits a thesis or prepares a thesis before submission i have to give i have to make sure that there is no plagiarism or or self plagiarism okay and i'll show you an example of that also um, so again um, the faculty member will have to make sure that everything is properly documented recorded and backed up with actual uh, data um some guidelines for academic conduct uh, that i have listed out here and these are not unknown to any of you uh, for example use proper methodology for doing experiments and computational work accurately describe and compile data and basically you know keeping good record of data very frequently what happens when i you know in my own research group i meet my group every sunday morning for a group meeting and they have to summarize what they have done in the previous week and that's very standard in most research groups i guess maybe not on sunday morning but anyway many times what i find is that students are showing me data which is a processed data i always insist that i would like to see the raw data because sometimes they say that you know i see a nice straight line i said looks like there's a point missing because in the x axis there's a big gap no sir the data point was off so i removed it i said look in the group meeting i would like to see all the data points whether that data should remain data point should remain there or not that should be discussed and you should repeat such experiments so uh, it is very important that the primary data are always saved securely uh, so that if there is any ever any doubt it can be checked back again this is some, this is not something that is new and of course uh, reproducibility and statistical analysis of data particularly when you are looking at uh, variation of some kind of in the in the analytical results you know that is something that is very common here um one has to worry about the reproducibility particularly if you are analyzing the same sample again and again and as i mentioned here that the so called cherry picking uh, where some data points are omitted to make the result look nice Uh, again is not acceptable and is considered to be unethical behavior uh, a few more points on the guidelines that you know this is again something that in the context of uh, students it's more applicable that uh, lab notebooks should be very clearly recorded uh, maintained and uh, they should write in their own words and there should not be any copy copying and pasting which is of course is a is a very uh, common issue these days uh, Uh, particularly when students prepare reports and uh, we look at those things you know um, it, it's absolutely uh, unacceptable that uh, things are copied and pasted uh, recently i was uh, looking at a proposal and i found that even though the pi has given a certificate that it has not been plagiarized but when i ran it through a uh, sort of a high end anti plagiarism software i found that certain sections of it was were completely uh, cut and paste uh, from several sources and of course the plagiarism check software was able to detect and show it to me so clearly the pi had no clear idea about what amounts to plagiarism um i will focus a little bit more on plagiarism but again uh, just to be sure uh, just to make sure that i am not accused of plagiarism i have given the citation here that all these slides with a magenta outline like this uh, they have been taken from professor chandrashekharan's presentation on a similar topic on plagiarism and uh, scientific publishing again i would like to point uh, bring back the old uh, uh, statement that copying from one person is cheating copying from many is research but uh, as uh, this gentleman says fittingly this is from a department of geology university of georgia that basically this kind of a plagiarism is nothing other than theft because you are using uh, hard earned data from somebody else and you are simply not working hard enough 
and uh, using material provided by somebody else without acknowledging, of course. What can be plagiarized? Anything and everything. You know, again, this is something that we all know very well. Uh, so the basically the point is that no control C, control V. So no cutting and pasting. As long as you are using Windows for Mac users, sorry, commands are different. Okay. So uh, basically the point is that whether you are lazy or you deliberately do cutting and pasting, you are a plagiarist and thus guilty of plagiarism. And uh, in an it is an academic offense and can lead to sanctions like any other academic transgression. And I'll show you some examples. And this is some old data from uh, 2010, where uh, there have been many uh, types of reviewer biases uh, shown here, but um, uh, various types of ethical issues, reviewer bias, uh, research fraud, plagiarism, duplicate submission, duplicate publication, and so on. But you see that plagiarism amount was the highest occurrence. So that seems to be the major uh, issue with many of these, uh, many of these problems. Uh, so again, uh, just to remind that correct citation is the key, crediting the work of others, including my advisors or my own previous work by citation is more important because it, it really puts my current work in the proper context. It also maintains the credibility and accuracy of the scientific literature. Uh, sometimes, even if I am moving a sentence or modifying a sentence, I should not actually follow a few uh, simple moving some words here and there. Because as, as this particular slide says, paraphrasing is restating others' ideas by changing their words, but not copying them word for word. So I should not maintain the same sentence structure, in fact. I should, I should change it. Um, there was a time when uh, a very famous person uh, was accused of self-plagiarism, but he said, I simply use the sentence because there is no other way, no better way to explain the same uh, feeling. Uh, of course, that is no longer uh, acceptable. Um, <clears throat> What is acceptable, what are unacceptable are using exact phrases from the original source without enclosing them in quotation marks, as I, as I mentioned earlier, and emulating sentence structure even when using different words. So uh, one of the good anti-plagiarism software is called Turnitin. Um, this is something that uh, is more appropriate for universities. Uh, I don't know whether the CSI system has Turnitin, uh, but we do, and I will show you a, a, an output from that. But once again, uh, when you check a document for plagiarism using Turnitin, you have to be aware of certain places where even a high score may not mean that it has been fully plagiarized. Um, basically, this is uh, what happens in, the, uh, in this plagiarism check software, that manuscripts are check checked against a database of several tens of millions of peer-reviewed articles. Uh, it generates a similarity check and uh, it shows you the percentage of similarity text with respect to certain, uh, with respect to the source. And I, again, I will, I will illustrate this with, with an example from my own lab. This should be taken as a general guide. A high percentage, as I mentioned earlier, does not necessarily indicate plagiarized text. It could be legitimate citation and bibliography because bibliography is uses a text which is very similar in most publications. You know, sometimes the format may change, but otherwise it remains the same. And therefore, you would normally see that when you are checking your own manuscript, there is a very high plagiarism uh, percentage uh, for the bibliography. But that's not to be worried about, and that can be eliminated. Uh, this uh, example, for, ex uh, for instance, is uh, from a PhD thesis from one of my former one of my students who submitted recently. Um, so uh, she gave me the thesis. Uh, she ran the plagiarism check. And so I, when I analyzed, it appeared that, for example, you know, there was a, this, this item, which is highlighted, is basically shown as being plagiarized check. But is it a serious problem? No, it's not, because it's just the department's address. A doctoral thesis, a, a, a thesis submitted for the degree of doctor of philosophy, you know, that is also highlighted. So obviously you have to know 
that what should be seriously taken and what should not be seriously taken. But when I looked at the text, the text looked fine. Uh, again, the high percentage uh, was in the bibliography or in the references section. So again, that is something that one should not look at it very, very seriously. So, so here the total uh, uh, originality report showed 18% uh, similarity index, but when you analyze it, when you break it down into different parts of the document, you find that you know most of it is in the bibliography or in standard experimental conditions and not in the main text. And that's where one has to be very, very clear. Uh, and I would now like to focus on something that I have highlighted before, uh, just a few more points, and before I show you a few examples. One of them is that this non-publication of data, as I mentioned earlier also, uh, that not all the collected data are shown in the, in the output, in the research report. And some data can be simply bad data, but the general principle is that you show all the data, including the bad data, and then you say why you think it is bad data and eliminate that and then reanalyze the results. And that's the right and correct way of um, giving uh, a report. Uh, the other issue is about data gathering. Uh, sometimes it may also happen that the equipment is faulty and the, therefore the data generated uh, are all wrong. Uh, this of course can also amount to, uh, it may appear that there is falsification of data, but it is in some way it's basically bad or sloppy research. So what one should do is to make sure that any equipment that I'm using is first checked with authentic samples and a, a, a standard sample is run to make sure that the equipment is fine. Again, these are things that you know I don't need to tell this audience about. Uh, again, repeating some of these uh, points uh, and uh, the, the data should typically be stored for at least three years, if not more. Uh, after the publication, and especially in an institution like yours and ours, it should be kept for decades to ensure that uh, the data are safe. Um, another issue that often leads to unethical practices is about authorship of uh, in publications. Um, and again, this is something that uh, has uh, important implications in, in publications in, uh, in, in terms of what is right, what is not right. Um, this is again taken from the same source, uh, which is uh, shown uh, at the bottom uh, right here. And basically what this source says that in order to be an author, uh, each individual shall have contributed to the manuscript in at least two of the following areas. And some of these areas are listed here. Significant manuscript writer, significant manuscript reviewer, concept and design, data acquisition, data analysis and interpretation, statistical expertise. Uh, I, I recall that long back, uh, I had sent a sample outside the country for some analytical data. And when I wanted to include the analyst's name for as, as a co-author, uh, the analyst simply refused. He said that I don't want to be, I, I simply, put the sample in a machine and got the data and sent it to you. And I have not contributed intellectually to your publication. And if you really want to include, then I have to write a paragraph in your uh, publication and I would like to see the publication. So eventually I, 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 I gave up because I could not <clears throat> get him to agree. And I appreciated that, that he simply provided the uh, results. So, so the point here is that, you know, the technicians do not necessarily become joint authors unless it is agreed upon that, you know, this is a collaboration of some sort and uh, therefore uh, the authorship uh, should be done in a certain way. There are again other issues uh, that uh, deal with authorship uh, problems. Uh, these are called gift authorship, ghost authorship and so on and so forth. I don't want to discuss many of these, but I would just like to uh, indicate a few um, specific examples. The other problem that also happens in, in research is uh, what is called, uh, well, there are three things. 
uh, how people sometimes maximize their publications. Uh, one is called salami slicing. So you are basically breaking up a work into a large number of small papers. The other one is called tiling, which is as illustrated with the, with tiles on the uh, in the image that uh, you are uh, you are basically uh, publishing sequence of uh, substantially overlapping papers uh, oops and the other one is uh, double publishing publishing the same thing twice okay uh, this is not what i wanted okay this is good all right <clears throat> A few real life stories, because after all, uh, you know, so far the talk has been largely academic, but uh, let's see some real life problems. And I would like to, since I have been an organic chemist, I'm an impure organic chemist, actually, because I do things which uh, are not in the mainstream of what my department colleagues always do. Um, so nevertheless, I just want to show you one example where, uh, unfortunately, the author was an Indian uh, chemist. Uh, involves fabrication of data. So uh, the original paper was published, uh, I have removed the name in Tetrahedron Letters, which is a very well-known organic chemistry journal for experimental organic chemistry in 1979. And subsequently, uh, these two authors and John Conforth is actually a Nobel laureate. So he published in the same journal three years later that failure to verify a reported synthesis of an aconitin skeleton the details are not important, but what he eventually concluded, what they eventually concluded is that the reported products of these three stages were not in fact obtained. He said that whatever was given were all falsified data. The experiments were never done. Okay. Now, such a paper would be very hard to publish these days because you need to provide a lot of supporting data. Uh, but, you know, 40 years ago, things were a little bit different. And the author which whom I have not uh, indicated here, uh, got away by publishing um, a paper which uh, reported work which was never done. Second example, uh, so this is fabrication of data. Okay, So the data are never produced but reported. Second one is about falsification of deliberate interference. This is also something that involved a chemist and I would not like to either reveal names or genders of the professor or the student involved, unless there is a slip of tongue. Um, a highly reputed professor A assigned a very challenging scientific project to a new PhD student B. So B completes the work and reports that the results are fantastic. And uh, so professor publishes three papers in a very top journal, back, almost back to back. Okay. But very soon, what happened is there were indications that the results were too good to be true. First of all, there was a fundamental principle that was uh, not uh, looked at very carefully. And that, again, amounts to an honest error, in my opinion. But more seriously, when the experiments were repeated in another country and by some other groups, because there were some doubts that the student B did not report what the student actually obtained. In order to avoid he or she, I will say they, which is the common practice these days. So it's singular they. Okay. <laughs> so um, so the what the student published appeared to be incorrect. Uh, reported appeared to be incorrect. So the professor asked other members of the research group to repeat the experiments, and those results were wrong. Student was invited to another country to repeat it because it was had some industrial. Uh, relevance. And as long as the student was there in the lab in the other country, reactions worked. And as soon as the student left, reactions did not work. Not only that, they also found out that student B not only deliberately falsified the experimental results, but also tried to interfere with the experiments being done by other people, change samples, change NMR data and things like that. So that led to deliberate interference. So eventually they set up a committee and the student had to leave without getting the degree. So that was the very heavy price to pay. And of course, the professor also ended up paying a price because the professor later on said in an interview that this problem, because 
the three papers had to be retracted. And the professor said that this cost the professor, I'm trying to avoid him or her, um, a very important prize, and the important prize was Nobel Prize. Um, retraction, since I mentioned the three papers were retracted. There are a lot of papers which are being retracted these days. Uh, again, there are better and smarter ways of checking whether the data are falsified, whether there is plagiarism, whether there are other issues with publications. And there's a, pay, there's a website called retractionwatch.com. Uh, if you look at it, it's actually uh, interesting reading sometimes. And I have chosen some uh, examples from October. And here you will see that these, uh, this was in October, I believe. Uh, this week at Retraction Work, they indicated what were the papers which were retracted. And one such example, for example, uh, for instance, is the two Japanese universities revoked PhDs, one for plagiarism and one because of cell line contamination. There are more issues in biology. Um, Elsevier retracts entire book that plagiarized heavily from Wikipedia. Uh, Imperial College London researchers fired for research misconduct, and the details are available um, on their website. Uh, these are interestingly in the context of coronavirus. Uh, as on 12th August 2021, when I collected the data, some 132 papers on coronavirus were actually retracted. And some of you may recall that uh, there was some issue about 5G technology and induction of coronavirus in skin cells. Okay, uh, because pe some people said that you know 5G technology is responsible for spreading of coronavirus and all that. So that paper was published, but eventually it was retracted. Uh, these are the world record holders for the largest number of uh, uh, retracted papers. Uh, fortunately, the first 15, uh, <laughs> nobody is from India. Uh, but I think there are a few who are very close to this sort of numbers, 35. Um, one point I would like to mention here is that sometimes retraction are done decades after the paper was published. And here is an example of a paper which was published in uh, March 2011, but it was retracted in August 2021 because it was brought to Lancet. You know, Lancet is a very important medicine journal. It was brought to their attention that the same authors published essentially the same paper in a Japanese journal uh, a year before. This was published in 2011, this is 2010, and uh, that was retracted uh, almost 10 years later. And there is a similar example involving a chemistry uh, case, uh, uh, well, not exactly in India, but uh, work done by an Indian in another country. Again, I don't want to get into, into the details of that. But um, Retraction Watch in October uh, 2021, these are some of the issues that have been discussed. Uh, Again, I don't want to get into uh, uh, talk about each of them individually, but the point here is that uh, there have been very serious allegations uh, based on which these papers were retracted and punitive actions were taken. Uh, so it is now very clear that if such wrongdoing in misconduct or misconduct is, uh, is found in publications, then very serious uh, serious steps are taken by uh, by the respective organizations, and I, I I do hope that you know what I presented in the last 45 plus minutes. Um, sorry about taking a few extra minutes. Um, has given you some sort of a broad idea, and as I mentioned uh, to you before, that I'm not an expert in in this. Um, but I hope that you know that from the collected material that I presented to you, it gives you a broad idea and at least makes you aware of the sources from which you can get more information. Uh, just to save time, I have not gone into the details of uh, some of the slides, and I also skipped a few slides in between, which were kind of hidden. Uh, but I will have all the slides, a full form of it, uh, available uh, to you. And um, if any of you need uh, more, uh, more details, I will be happy to share it with you. Uh, once again, uh, so this is in fact my last slide. 
I, I, I and um, um, basically, you know, a lot of problems that uh, come uh, in the Indian context is because largely students are not aware of what the issues are, how they should conduct themselves. So I think uh, based on what I have seen uh, even in our institution, even though these uh, documents are available on the website, but the students are never told that, you know, you need to follow this, you need to do this, or you shouldn't do such things. Uh, so therefore, many problems can be avoided if the students and the researchers are simply made aware of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, at least in, in, in today's context. So with this, I would like to close my talk. Uh, once again, I would like to thank Dr. Singh for the invitation to come back home and uh, to meet many of you for the first time. And uh, I would be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. There should be some question from Bilaspur. Sripal, can you, I can use this one. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, sir, this uh, this plagiarism and uh, what we say falsification of data. No, I, I, I one second. I, I think I can. Uh, shall I change this output from here to the one second? It has to connect to the speakers. Yeah, can you can you repeat your question, please? Okay, so sir, uh, myself, Dr. Sipal Singh from Simbar Bilajpur, sir. Okay. Okay. So uh, I just want to uh, know many times when I check the plagiarism, what you told uh, also sometimes even department name, even some uh, small, small words which are important to write a manuscript is also shown plagiarism. Uh, so many times it becomes very difficult that when you are writing uh, something like uh, if I'm writing an experiment and then uh, I know that this, this is a Okay, sir. Uh, so, uh, okay, sir. Sir, when, I, when I'm writing experiment. Yeah. I know that I have done this experiment by this way. So, so I can change second. that yeah. experiment by writing in another way because one I second, we, we are not hearing you. Just a second, we are trying to set things up. Hello, now now am I, am I audible? Maybe you can keep Hello. May I audible, sir? Mm. Yeah. Can you can you repeat can you repeat because only I was hearing your question. Okay 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 no no problem sir sir uh, in in chemistry when we carry out some experiment uh, yes in paper we write the experiment this is we write the procedure of uh, carrying out the experiment many yes. times it is shown as a plagiarism is it really a plagiarism? See as far as you know in my opinion if it is if the experimentals uh, are similar, uh, for example, many students copy from the previous uh, students' experimental portions, you know, the same general experimental section. And I don't think there is anything wrong in that because general experimental conditions remain the same. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. One student or another. As far as experiments are concerned, I feel that, you know, what happens is that even though you are repeating the same experiment, but again, it is always better to kind of change the language a little bit so that it's not identical. I mean, it can be, it is, it is, it is, it is exactly repetition of the same experiment, but it need not be described in the same words. But many times sir, it, uh, it looks very odd actually, because I know that this is the best way of writing the experiment. I have carried out experiment in this way. So this is the best way of writing experiment, writing the same experiment in other uh, format or words. It sometimes looks very odd, not uh, giving a very clear uh, picture. I, I think 
I think the uh, publishers are less forgiving as far as the experimental is concerned, but I think in, in terms of the main text or interpretations, it's probably a little more strict. Yes, uh, sir, yes, sir. Actually, but I think uh, when you're writing uh, discussion part, when you are uh, writing about the data, if you are copying, sometimes you are writing uh, others, uh, 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 what, what I can say, uh, and conclusions are uh, what they have done actually. So if you are citing that, we can just similarly say this is we received from, uh, we got from that author. And then it should be, I think, okay. But many times it also shows the plagiarism. Yeah, I, I think it, it, it depends. Sometimes, you know, it depends upon the publishing house because some publishing house are more strict. But I think if uh, I, I know that one of my colleagues recently had his uh, manuscript submitted and it came back from a well-known uh, journal saying that, you know, this is plagiarism from your own text. But uh, again, I think he had sent a rebuttal indicating that, uh, you know, this is maybe from my own text, but this is the representation of the similar experimental uh, uh, observations. And most of the sort of plagiarism flagging was in the experimental part. So I think eventually they accepted the arguments. Okay, so sir. sometimes I think, you know, the because most of these uh, software are AI driven. In, yes, sir. In yes. some way. Yes. But, and they do not necessarily do uh, as good a job as uh, human intelligence. So therefore, uh, even though, as I said, even though it may show, you know, 30% plagiarized text, uh, one has to look at it uh, section-wise and see where the main problems are and then argue with the publisher. I think that's the way to move forward. Many, many times in chemistry, when you're writing a formula, then plagiarism software says it is a plagiarism. But it exactly. Be, it exactly. That, that's what I showed with, uh, with a copy of my student's thesis, you know. Uh, thesis submitted for the partial fulfillment of PhD degree. That, of course, everybody will write the same thing. So yes. that will always appear to be plagiarized text. Yes. But of course, nobody takes it seriously. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Any, any other colleague uh, connected with the web? Uh, uh, Hars is, uh, is connected, actually, sir. Oh, anyone want to ask? Otherwise, we will go to the audience. Okay, then from our audience. Sure. Suppose there are some standard figures, like when we are discussing about the results, there are some standard figures or some ratios there. And if you are uh, dealing with water chemistry, there are some standard XY plots or some ionic ratios. And if you have used this, all these uh, figures or ratios in our different papers. Sometimes you find that comment that you have also already used these this figures in this paper, this paper, so this is a self-perfect example. Is it right? Um, yes, in fact, that again, um, I think that if I'm publishing a paper, let's say in a review article, you know, I in fact wrote a review article recently, one of my students wrote it, and he used uh, papers published, figures paper published in my earlier uh, publications. But again, we had to take permission from the journal for reuse in a review article. So every figure that we reproduced from the earlier publications had a statement that reproduced with permission from so and so. Not using the same figure or any like any diagram. This is a x y plot. Suppose the x y plot in to show the relationship between two ions. Yeah. Yeah. The data is different and our interpretation is also depending upon the whatever the ratio is there. Interpretation will be different, our finding will be different. Oh, if, if the data are different, then of course there is no issue. Area is different. Yeah. But only use that figure only. So then, then there, there should not be any issue. If, if one comment that you have already used this, such a ratio in different paper, so this is a self -value. I, I would say that self plagiarism because the data are different. You are essentially using a different plot. You are using a similar plot but with different data. That need not be considered to be self plagiarism. But I think in some cases when you uh, make certain changes, you can probably say that you know adapted from 
Sometimes, you know, we take a figure from an earlier publication and slightly modify it and present it in another review article. And there, uh, the statement to be made is that adopted from such and such figure or such and such journal. That re refer to the original work. As long as I think we are honest and refer to even our own work published earlier, there should be no problem, in my opinion. One more question. This is not a question. Actually, I want your observation. In recent years, we've seen that in many times, the viewers insist you to cite their own papers. In recently, <laughs> we have found that uh, one reviewers, but I have submitted the manuscript. Yeah. In the first review, there are three reviewers, they have given some general comments. And when I have submitted our revised, review, revised papers, they have, they have insisted me to add nine references. And all references are from their own research groups. And this is what were the, they have suggested differences that not liking matching with the our turn. What were the manuscript is called substack. At least our manuscript is dealing with the water chemistry of Himalayan rivers. And all the suggested papers are dealing with the peninsular rivers. So I have not agreed with their suggestions. Yeah. I have written to editor that I am not agreed with cite all these papers because this is not matching with our idea. And editors uh, immediately I think you did, the, you did the right thing because, you know, I, without getting into too many other details, uh, there are uh, some pressure sometimes from reviewers because reviewers have something else in mind. I don't want to get into that in, in an open forum, um, talk to you privately after my presentation. Uh, I have also seen a recently in a review party uh, paper that I submitted, uh, one of the reviewers asked, uh, several papers from his group to be included in the review. Uh, and again, you know what the motivation is, uh, which I won't say right now. Uh, but this does happen. But you did the right thing to complain to the editor that, you know, if, if it is relevant, yes, 100% I will include it if I missed it earlier. But if it is not relevant, why should I include it? Exactly. I completely agree with you. I think you did the right thing. Absolutely, absolutely. This this does happen. Many times they have been blacklisted. The reviewers have been blacklisted. I know three pair of scientists from the Bible Institute of the South Bolivia. We have retained and they have been blacklisted. The reviewers have been blacklisted. Yes. Anyone, any colleague? Otherwise, the tea, the tea is waiting for us and you people. So, it was really nice. Sir. Talking and uh, listening to you, Udesa. That's why it's small, some Thank you. Thank you. I, I really enjoyed uh, interacting with you. But um, as, as I said, that you know, this is really not my area of expertise. Uh, so in the future, uh, if you need any more inputs on this, but I have collected a lot of uh, data, a lot of uh, publications in this uh, area, um, and my talks keep evolving because the first time I gave this talk was in fact in an undergraduate college course in uh, Bethune College in Calcutta. They had a, um, for all undergraduate students, you know, they did something very, very good. For all undergraduate students of 2020 batch, they had this certificate course on ethics and about 14 lectures and I gave one of these lectures on uh, research uh, ethics and integrity. Um, and then of course in the CSIR system, this is the third time after NCL and IICT. Uh, but every time I add and make some changes because I also learn by talking to you and based on questions which are asked. So I keep modifying it. So it is version three or 3.5 point. Uh, but uh, any of you would like to get more information or some of the files that I showed before with additional data, I'll be more than happy to share those. Uh, we will keep it in the director secretary and uh, if anyone wants, we sure. can send to the email. Sure. So please come. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for invigorating us with his limpid perspicacity of your uh, talk. Now, I personally feel that, sir, the many of the things were obfuscated before this lecture. And I really thank you for your great lecture, sir. <laughs> <laughs>
Now I would like to request our director sir to felicitate uh, Professor Maitra with a. Thank you, sir. Then we have one. Yes, I think I 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 have one. Yes,